So thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, this is the July um, seminar for the New South Wales branch uh, um, of the Statistical Society of Australia, even if it's in August. Um, I'll start uh, um, the seminar by acknowledging the traditional owners uh, on the lands uh, on which uh, the University of Sydney, where we are, um, um, are from the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And we pay our respect uh, to the knowledge uh, embedded forever within the Aboriginal custodianship of the country. It is very, it is like my name is Clara Graziana, um, and I am the current president uh, of the New South Wales branch uh, of uh, um, uh, the, the SSA. And it's my um, great pleasure to introduce you um, to Dr. Sheila Gazanfar, um, who has completed her undergraduate and PhD studies in statistics and bioinformatics in the University of Sydney. Uh, and then uh, she moved uh, to the University of Cambridge. Uh, with a Royal Society New to International Fellowship. And then she came back to Sydney um, uh, with a DECRA Fellowship. So um, Sheila's interests are in developing statistical bioinformatic and biomedical data science approaches uh, for the meaningful integration of complex and high dimensional biological data sets. She's an expert in statistical and computational analysis uh, of spatial transcriptomics and single cell RNA sec uh, data. So um, Sheila today, tonight, is going to um, talk uh, um, about mosaic single cell data integration. And before starting the seminar, um, I would like to ask all of you to check uh, if uh, your microphone is mute. Um, I'm happy to get um, um, in order to uh, avoid noise uh, during uh, uh, the seminar, because this seminar is also recorded uh, to be available for our members after. So thank you very much, Sheila, for joining us tonight, uh, and um, the floor is, is yours. Thanks so much, Clara. <clears throat> um, and my uh, apologies for uh, not not being able to join you in person um, this time around. I was I was very excited to 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 be there in person, but then unfortunately, uh, a mystery uh Lurgy has hit me so I'm still testing negative but we'll, we'll see what happens um so uh my uh talk will be about mosaic single cell data integration and so I guess I should preface um by uh, sort of arguing why single cell genomics why are we interested in this in terms of our um uh, interests in uh, statistical bioinformatics and in um, biomedical data science. So in general, the, the cell is the basic unit of life. Um, so at the single cell level, you know, we can identify individual cell identities. Um, so in terms of types and subtypes, um, we can look at states and behaviors individually, um, as well as looking at various processes. Um, so, you know, considering the cell as an individual uh, unit of observation, it means that when we're uh, looking at the, the data sets that come from single cell um, technologies, um, we're able to characterize populations of cells um, in, in ways that we perhaps were not able to do before. Um, so to, uh, to motivate a little bit with um, work that uh, came from my postdoc, um, in our research group, uh, we were quite interested in the basic biological um, question of understanding early organogenesis in mice. Um, and so here, you know, the, the, the interest was very much in understanding the um, what happens to individual cells across time as uh, cells go from being a very relatively um, <clears throat> Uh, a relatively um, uh, simple three-layer uh, embryo, uh, and then over the span of just a few days, um, in the mouse, these this this 
three layers suddenly transforms into uh, a myriad of cells uh, with different types that will uh, form essentially the body plan and, and turn into an entire organism. And so in general, the question is, you know, how, how is it that um, these cells uh, know how they're going to diversify into these cell types um, and, and what, what are the factors that, that affect this. So uh, here what this uh, animation is showing you is a U-map, uh, so this is a, a non-linear dimension reduction where each point corresponds to an individual cell um, and the panels are showing the added uh, times, the, the cells that belong to these individual time points as we are progressing through development. Now, um, so this was work done by my colleagues. Um, the colors correspond to the individual types of cells. So, you know, we can look at, say, the, the blood being uh, generated. Um, now, here the interest was looking at cells and their profiles in time, um, and where I came in with um, my postdoc project was to expand this towards looking at cells in space. Um, so that UMAP projection, I mean, while it's pretty to look at, um, it doesn't necessarily look that much like a mouse embryo. Um, and so with, with a number of um, amazing collaborators, uh, we performed um, some experiments to be able to capture uh, the uh, profiles of the genes being expressed in the native uh, tissue context for hundreds of genes. Um, and so to put you in context, what you're seeing here on the panel uh, uh, to the left, um, this is a whole organism a uh, sagittal cross-section of a mouse embryo at the stage of about 8.5 or 8.75 8, 8 days uh, uh, post-fertilization. So the top part here corresponds to the head, um, the middle part corresponds to the heart, uh, along the side this is the trunk, so what will form the, the spine, and then curling around is the tail. And so in this picture, I've only colored four genes, but note that for this data set, we actually have captured 350 genes. So, you know, if I had more and more colors, maybe I could put them all on top of the same picture. Now, the other thing that um, I want to uh, sort of have us appreciate about this uh, data that we generated was that we are capturing information across multiple scales. So, you know, on the left here, we have the whole organism section. So we're looking at essentially the entire um, space. But if we zoom in, then we're able to see that we're looking more in depth at the tissue level. Um, and then furthermore, if we zoom in yet again, then we can uh, get to the cellular and the subcellular level. So these white outlines correspond to the segmented areas of um, uh, individual cells. Um, and so the, 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 I think, I, I, I hope we can sort of appreciate the richness of, of this kind of data. You know, we have not only the information corresponding to where each cell is, um, but as well as, you know, how many um, particular copies of a, a particular gene we might have in in each cell, but we also have where they are in space. Um, not only that, we have, a, you know, some kind of measure of, you know, how they relate to each other as well. And these are all information that, you know, we, we could be able to use um, if, if we're able to sort of code this in in a, in a useful way. Now, um, of course, we can use the cell segmentation, so these white boundaries, to uh, get back to that uh, sort of fundamental unit of observation, right, the single cell. Um, and that allowed us to perform a, a data integration task. So here um, on the top here, this is that UMAP generation of our dissociated single cell RNA-seq. Um, so this was our time course where we did not have the spatial coordinates. Um, and then on the bottom here is actually what that UMAP projection 
extraction would look like for our spatial data. So if I took these cells and instead of plotting them in their native XY, if I plot them into uh, the, 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 uh, the transcriptional space, then this is what I'm seeing. Now, to perform the, the data integration, um, what we did was uh, a, an approach that I think was quite reasonable and quite decent at the time, uh, was to restrict to the overlapping set of genes. So uh, in our dissociated study, you know, we had access to essentially the entire transcriptome. So this is some 20,000 genes. Um, whereas for our imaging, our Seekfish data, you know, we had quite a number, 350, but obviously not to the, the whole transcriptome extent. So we restrict to that subset of, of genes. And then we use a, a technique uh, typically used in um, single cell analyses for performing data integration called mutual nearest neighbors. And that allowed us to, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, to essentially embed uh, our sets of cells into a common low dimensional space. And so what I'm showing here is a UMAP plot. Um, again, this is a nonlinear, low dimensional uh, uh, representation uh, where the cells corresponding to our, uh, our single cell RNA-seq uh, are colored by orange and then the, the seq fish cells are colored by blue. And I mean, what we can see is that we see nice overlap between them. We would hope that would be the case because these are all um, uh, wild type, they're not, um, we, we would expect them to be very similar. Um, so it's nice that they do overlap with each other. And the goal there, <coughs> excuse me, was to take um, basically this curated um, cell type information and transfer it over to our um, spatial data. And we did that um, just using a uh, uh, machine learning. So we use K nearest neighbor classification to do that. And so here, if I split out again our UMAPs um, using our single cell RNA seq, but then uh, with our seq fish, we see that we've colored our cells based on their predicted cell type. And that allowed us to essentially take our uh, our, our spatially resolved data and be able to uh, more or less color our cells using the same uh, cell type annotation as as uh, as we had previously worked on. Um, now there are a few things that we could do with that, you know, uh, a few just plain observations that we could make um, was that, you know, we observe uh, a set of different distributions of cells in space. So, you know, we can see that, you know, the cardiomyocytes, as, as we would have hoped, um, appear where, where we think that the heart should be and the gut tube uh, extends sort of from, from the start of, of the tube right up to the end there, as well as the endothelium, which uh, will give rise to the blood uh, existing all across the embryo. Um, so this uh, really was was a motivating work um, for for me over the last few years um, because it really got me to thinking about you know where we're going with um, single cell technologies and in terms of the data sets that are becoming available. So what we're seeing um, essentially is that. On the one hand, we have, you know, uh, as, as time goes on, we're seeing an increase in the number of single cell transcriptomic uh, data sets. So this is like the single cell RNA-seq like I showed you before. So, you know, over time, you know, we're seeing this sort of uh, increase very much. Um, but then at the same time, we're also observing uh, an increase in the variety of single cell technologies as well. And so by that, I mean, um, looking over at this schematic here, um, for any given cell, you know, we have a number of different technologies uh, where, you know, spatial position, so seek fish is one example, where we're capturing uh, potentially different 
pieces of information about these cells. And the, the samples may actually be, you know, relevant and comparable to each other. They may all be wild type samples that we may want to be able to combine in some way. But the challenge might be that there are differences in the technologies that we're seeing. And uh, as a corollary to that, it's the differences in the feature types that we're actually capturing. So for example, you know, if we've captured, say for our, our mouse embryos, you know, others may have captured uh, some information about the DNA structure or some information about the lineage. And if we don't necessarily have that uh, coded in uh, with our, say, typical single cell RNA-seq, then that's, that's, that's a bit of a challenge because we don't have the overlap with, with um, the, the features. So our aim overall is to be able to capitalize on all information sources to be able to perform these joint analyses. <coughs> and so to, to formalize these problems, um, I uh, point uh, us all to uh, this review article from um, last year, I believe, um, from the group uh, that essentially broke down um, these questions in uh, single cell data integration. So an example, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, single cell data integration may be uh, basically one of four types. Um, first is horizontal integration. And so here we have an example of populations of cells that have been profiled. Um, and what has been profiled is basically the same type of uh, information. So here, this little squiggle followed by AA corresponds to um, polyadenylated mRNA. So this is gene expression. And each of these populations, we, we're capturing gene expression, the same set of features across multiple cells. And so if we are to sort of characterize this um, in terms of, you know, the, the, the data matrices that we may be getting, um, what we can, <coughs> excuse me, um, see here, uh, is that, you know, if we group uh, features, this would be the genes um, and the cells, we have a commonality across the horizontal axis, right? So therefore we have horizontal int integration where the features are what is common between the cells. Now on the flip side, if we have a single population and uh, uh, a, a sophisticated technology that allows us to simultaneously profile a number of different uh, biological information. So for example, uh, the RNA <coughs> again, or the, um, the sort of DNA methylation uh, information or a chromatin accessibility. So these are all, you know, pieces of information about a cell um, that, that may be disparate, but happen to be captured in the one populations of cells, we would term this as vertical integration, right? So we have the cells being the uh, common, the common uh, piece of the puzzle here, I, I would say. Um, and then we have the features that are, are distinct among them. Um, and so, there are techniques uh, to perform horizontal integration. There are techniques to perform vertical integration. Um, uh, but what I think is a real challenge is when things are not so clean um, as just simply horizontal and vertical. And this is what we term as mosaic integration. Um, so in this in this toy example, we sort of have this Mm, hodgepodge of um, data that is sort of captured for for some sets of cells, you know, for, for say this group of cells, we've got the assay A, B and D, but we've got C missing. And then in sample B, we've got B and C, but then the other two are missing and so on and so on. So uh, I, I mean, I believe that the mosaic integration 
problem uh, is is probably uh, for, for better or worse sort of where we're going if we want to be able to use as much information that's uh, becoming available to us um, but also is a worthwhile challenge to, to try to solve um, because there is opportunity for for being able to you know use use this information um, excuse me <clears throat> And I mean, why do I say that? I mean, this is uh, the 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 uh, I guess the way that things are things are progressing uh, as time goes on. You know, we see that it's not just single cell single omics that that is uh, developing. It's multimodal omics. It's spatially resolved transcriptomics. And I mean. It might be that the method of 2022 is spatially resolved multi-omics. It might, it might happen, or maybe it might be the next year. Um, but in any case, uh, I, I think that mosaic integration is, is a, a worthwhile problem for us to, to aim to solve. Now, I already uh, sort of showed you in, in the first bit of the talk about how we tried to attack this problem um, of, of integrating our information. <coughs> so our RNA-seq data, you know, we had 20,000 features, but then for, for the other set, uh, for the, our spatial data, we had 350 genes. So our naive approach essentially there was to restrict to only the intersecting features. And if I take this sort of toy um, schematic as an example, you know, if I look across uh, these sets of cells and try to find some intersecting features, um, I'd have a bad time because there's actually no intersecting features. There's no features that are actually con consistently present across all of the data sets. So if I were to try to analyze whatever this data is, I would actually have to throw out a data set um, and then have to do something else with it or maybe design some kind of ad hoc way of, of, of um, bringing it in. So let's say we throw out our first, our first data set, um, then we might be in a situation where we could uh, use our naive approach, where we could say, okay, uh, the, the set of features that are consistent across um, this data is basically these blue shaded ones. And so therefore, I'm going to transform my overall mosaic data integration problem into what's essentially a horizontal data integration problem. And yeah, I can do this because there are existing methods for performing horizontal data integration. Um, you know, <coughs> excuse me, uh, mutual nearest neighbors is an example, SC merge is an example, there are, there are a number of these. Um, but the issue is that I'm basically ignoring the yellow, the green and the purple. Um, and what if there was relevant information there? What if there was some very uh, biologically relevant uh, signal that may not be so pronounced in our blue data set, uh, in our blue sort of set of features that we're then missing out on? Okay, um, so to, to just sort of... Um, uh, I guess hammer it in a little bit more is that yes, we use the naive approach in our spatial uh, application um, and it, it worked well um, and I believe it worked well because our set of intersecting features, that 351 genes, were a really uh, well selected panel of genes that were specific to being able to identify these individual cell types. Um, and it might not always be the case that the naive approach works well. Um, so another thing to note is that, you know, I, I, want to, I want us to sort of distinguish these two flavors of mosaic data integration. You know, one is that, you know, if you have a set of intersecting features that you could 
uh, potentially transform into a horizontal data integration problem. Um, and the other being this disjoint set. Um, so a disjoint mosaic data integration where, you know, there actually are the, the, the set of intersecting features across all data sets is actually the empty set. And of course, as you add on uh, additional data sets, say if you want to do a, a, um, a big, uh, like a big meta analysis of all, um, all types of single cell resolved um, uh, data for a particular sample, you may end up being in this space here. Uh, so specifically, the goals for our project um, was to uh, develop a technique that performs mosaic data integration um, and somehow makes use of the information that you know, we we sort of have available to us from these non-intersecting features that we're potentially not capitalizing on uh, at present. Uh, we want to be able to enable disjoint mosaic data integration. So perhaps, you know, we could use those relationships that we learn uh, from some other uh, data to then be able to uh, sort of <laughs> add on that first data set. Um, so could we extract some feature uh, relationships across the data sets? And then finally, we want to be able to incorporate prior information from cell labels um, in the mosaic data integration. So it may be that we already know a lot about, say, one, one particular data set, and we'd like to be able to uh, uh, distinguish cells according to that um, labeling. So why uh, would we perform mosaic data integration? I mean, I hope that I've, I've made it a little bit clear that uh, this is sort of a problem that we might be seeing more of. Um, but uh, being able to represent all cells in a common low dimensional embedding, this allows us to perform sort of joint uh, uh, downstream analyses. So, I mean, of course we can visualize uh, in the same low dimensional space, we can perform joint supervised and unsupervised learning. Um, and, you know, we can perform other kinds of bespoke tests um, such as, <coughs> looking at differences in cell abundances. So what, what proportion of cells are present in one, say, sample group uh, versus another. Um, and finally, you know, we could use uh, this, uh, this sort of low dimensional mapping to then perform some kind of point imputation to get an estimate of what that missing modality is. Um, so could we, for example, impute the chromatin state for those that we measure using only the RNA? So could we get DNA information from the RNA? Now, um, as, as I was sort of thinking about these problems and, you know, formulating the, the approach, um, there are two other approaches that, uh, uh, were developed um, in that time. So first was uh, unshared um, uh, non-negative matrix factorization, which has since been published. Um, and this approach um, essentially uses uh, an, an additional um, unshared matrix to be able to take uh, two data sets. So here we've got um, a, a a, a data, a two input data. So we have a common G features and then the, these uncommon um, Z1 and Z2 features, um, and then a, a set of different cells. And the goal here is to perform a, a, a matrix factorization to the common K factors, uh, uh, but then from this be able to uh, extract this uh, common K by N um, low dimensional embedding. So the, the approach there is, is applied essentially to single cell RNA-seq 
to single site ataxy. So this is a technique that uses a chromatin um, uh, that, that profiles the openness of chromatin, um, as well as in targeted spatial approaches. So this is the UINMF approach. Um, and an, an additional one is multi-map, which has also been um, since published. So this approach um, uses uh, essentially a graph embedding uh, uh, technique. Um, and within this graph embedding, the, the assumption is made that there is a uniform distribution of cells uh, across this graph, uh, across the, the different um, uh, multimodal information. And so then from that optimization, you're able to extract essentially a two-dimensional um, embedding. So it's, it's somewhat similar to the UMAP algorithm. Um, and and the, end of, the end result is that, you know, you have this two-dimensional uh, 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 embedding that you can then use for your downstream analysis. So for example, for uh, machine learning and so on. So I think it's quite nice that um, these these two techniques um, uh, came out when they did. Uh, it did sort of uh, give me a little bit of hope that you know I wasn't just thinking about these things on my own. It's that that this is sort of where the field is going. Um, and so I'd like to introduce uh, the technique that um, I developed. Um, so this is stab map, stable map. Um, mosaic single cell data integration using non-overlapping features. And so there are three key steps um, within the StabMap algorithm. So first is to identify, <coughs> excuse me, a mosaic data in data topology. Um, then uh, the, the second step is to build supervised or unsupervised embeddings of individual selected reference data sets. And then following on from that is to predict and project any of the non-reference cells to the reference cells by traversing the shortest paths along the mosaic data topology. And so by performing this sort of step three, it means that we're able to also perform this sort of disjoint uh, integration by being able to traverse along different um, uh, paths. So <clears throat> let me um, illustrate this more with uh, a, a schematic. Um, so imagine here we have uh, three observed data matrices. Okay, and so here we have the rows corresponding to the features and the columns corresponding to the cells. So we have our red data set, our blue data set, and our yellow data set. And note that if we look across at the features, there's actually no shared features between the red and the yellow uh, data sets here. Um, so they're only connected, if you will, via the blue sort of bridge, bridge data set. Um, and so based on this, what we can do is take each of these matrices and we can represent each one as a node in a network. <coughs> and we will create an edge uh, depending on whether there are any sh shared features between them. So between the red and the blue, um, we have shared features, this, this sort of set of features here. Um, therefore, we have an edge. And between the blue and the yellow, we have a shared set of features um, uh, there. But then we have none between our red and the yellow. Now, our ultimate goal is to perform a embedding so that we have a low dimensional um, uh, sort of feature space. <coughs> and our cells. Now, I've also sort of highlighted this red data set as, as being um, our selected reference for, for this uh, uh, particular example. So what we want is to perform the embedding using our red data set as, as a reference. Um, and so how do we do that? Um, first, we would perform a low dimensional embedding using only our reference data set. 
So here I have a, a number of dimensions corresponding to our reference data and the points uh, corresponding to the cells for this data. Um, and then our goal is to take uh, the cells corresponding to uh, the, the sort of next, uh, the, the next nearest data set um, and project onto that space. And we do this um, using a, a, a linear model approach. So what we're performing is essentially a multi-variable, multi-variate uh, um, uh, linear modeling uh, between the intersecting features between the, the, the two data sets and our target feature space, so our target um, low dimensional space. So in this case, by default, we use uh, principal components, um, but note that we could actually use uh, linear discriminants uh, if we have our labels uh, associated with ourselves as well. So then, um, you know, once we fit this model, it means that for our uh, second data set, then what we're doing is simply projecting those, uh, those observations <coughs> uh into uh into that space so we we're essentially predicting using our model um into uh the the principal component or the linear discriminant space now the the thing that uh i think is nice about about this method is that you know you can do uh the next step over so you know if we're if we're wanting to uh then embed our next data set, the yellow data set, there's actually no shared features between yellow and our reference, but there are shared features between the yellow and the blue. And so what we can do is we can piggyback um, off of that. So we can uh, essentially build up a, a new model um, where we're uh, again, building a multivariate, multivariable um, linear model. Um, however, as our input is the set of intersecting features between the yellow and the blue. Um, and then we're projecting our yellow cells into our blue reference space. And then using the original um, model, then we're performing that, that projection again. And so in the end, we have a, a, a joint embedding of, of our data, um, uh, of, of all our data into the one reference space. So here the reference space is our red. Now we could do the same thing if we had chosen yellow to be our reference. Um, we could have done the same thing again if we, if we had chosen blue to be our reference. Um, and indeed what we can do is we can select multiple references and then concatenate um, these, uh, these feature spaces um, together um, and, and uh, potentially perform some um, uh, waiting to to uh, uh, to to give some weight to potentially one data set that you may uh, want to um, sort of understand a bit more or you may know that there is sort of more bi biological variation that you want to be exploring or you could do it just equally of course um so SABMAP, uh, like any uh, method, um, has requirements, uh, features, and uh, limitations. Um, so, of course, the, the, the topology network structure itself must be connected. So if you have a data set that's just sitting on its own and there are zero shared features at all, um, for example, in this diagonal uh, integration uh, uh, scenario, um, then stabmap is unfortunately not the method for you. Um, as for how you would go about um, addressing this kind of problem, I think that this is still an open area of research, um, depending on how much sort of prior information you have available to you and you're willing to use. Um, but stabmap does not perform diagonal uh, integration. Um, you do need to have at least one reference data set and by default all are used as, as references and then they're concatenated. Now in terms of features, 
Um, <coughs> Stamma is uh, uh, written to be general. So it works for any type of connected topology. So you need not have uh, sort of only two data sets or only three or only one being a subset of the other. It's, it's, it, it works for any kind of um, uh, topology so long as it's uh, connected. Um, now, like I said, the contribution of, of the different reference spaces can be reweighted. Um, now, it is deterministic, so uh, you, you are um, just using, so if, if you run it again, unless you're using some very sort of approximating um, PCA, uh, you will be getting the same uh, result. Uh, for better or worse, it is a linear uh, approach. Um, and uh, it is sensitive to centering and scaling of input data, just as just as PCA is. And the the last point here is is uh, probably more of an intuitive point um, rather than a feature that it's it's sort of only as strong as its weakest link. And this is something that we would we would kind of think that you know if if there is a, a particular data set where there is either not enough uh, observations or not enough features, um, then we may not be able to have enough um, sort of predictive power to be able to transfer that information across. Um, now, of course, we, we assume uh, that there's no confounding of, of biological signal between, <coughs> excuse me, between the data sets and modalities. Um, because, I mean, if they were, then we would be seeing basically uh, orthogonal um, uh, uh, projections and then you, you'd have not enough um, information. And like I mentioned, that there is enough biological information among these shared features uh, to, to be able to perform the, the um, uh, mosaic data integration effectively. Cool. So with that, um, uh, there are a, a few sort of illustrations that uh, I've performed. Um, so the first is a simulation using um, a, a multi-omics data set. So this is a single uh, a data source um, where <coughs> individual cells uh, had both RNA information and chromatin information captured at the same time. So for every point in this uh, top UMAP, um, there is a matching point in the bottom UMAP here. Um, and the colors correspond to the individual types of cells. And so what I do is a simulation where I uh, basically unpair these uh, two modalities. And then I ask, how well can we match them up again? Um, using our different approaches. And overall, what we can see is that if we uh, use uh, a, an approach like StabMap or a naive approach, like just using PCA of our uh, overlapping um, features, uh, as well as UI and MF and Multimap, we see uh, overall uh, comparable results. We do have a slight um, increase in cell type accuracy with StabMap, um, and, and overall we have uh, just like a, a, a slight increase. Um, but overall, I'd say it's, it's fairly comparable uh, across these. And that does speak to this sort of underlying assumption of, you know, how much information do you have in that a common set of features. And so from that, I perform a second simulation where uh, I take, uh, it's basically a, a stress test on uh, how, how far can we take stab map and how far can we take the other um, methods as well. So if I took our RNA, um, our full 20,000 RNA uh, mouse embryo data, and if I subset that down, uh, to really, really small numbers of, of um, genes. So here, what I'm showing is just 200 uh, sort of randomly selected genes. Um, so not optimally selected genes. Then I'm seeing a, a, a sort of market improvement of, of stab map across the others. Um, and so again, these are UMAP plots 
where I have the query data set as well as the reference and then colored by the, the two. And I guess the, the plot that I sort of want to uh, draw your attention to is this one here where we have the number of genes uh, of the subset. So right down is the very, very small subset of genes, only 100. And then we have the cell type classification accuracy on the y-axis. So we would want this to be really high. And um, what we can see is that it's, it's higher for submap. And then as you increase the number of features, then all of the methods equalize as, as you would hope that they would. Um, now we perform uh, another uh, sort of illustration, uh, I guess, to in, to show that you know we're able to perform this disjoint integration. Um, and here we again take that RNA and chromatin data set. Um, however, we do not perform a feature matching step. So here, if I look at the uh, the mosaic. Uh, data topology, um, what I have is that the attack and the RNA are no longer linked to each other like they were in the first uh, simulation. And so if we perform this, uh, uh, this integration using stabmap, then we find that we uh, obtain reasonable results. <coughs> So in particular, if we use uh, the UMAP uh, low dimensional space um, and we color by the individual data set, we see that we have good match uh, mixing of, of these cells as we should because they're all randomly selected from the same set. Um, and then at the same time, we have good uh, discrimination of the individual types of cells, um, which we would hope to be the case. Um, and so in the last uh, you know, few minutes, um, I'd like to just sort of uh, illustrate a, a real data analysis example. So what I would showed you in these last three, three little snippets, these were simulations. So it was, it was me taking sort of a full data set and then removing something and then seeing if we could get it back. Um, but I'd like to illustrate a um, example here. <coughs> that you know very much is is basically the motivation behind this work so you know i started with um single cell rna seq data um and i had this spatially resolved um genomics data and so the goal here is to <coughs> excuse me is to perform a a mosaic data integration where I make use of the genes that are not in the SeqFish library, but I'm also wanting to make use of the nearest neighbor's expression. So these are the gene expression of the cells that are most proximal to uh, the other cells in physical space. So, you know, what are what's the expression of the cells that are in my immediate vicinity? Now, of course, these features you know, if we had some kind of imaging full transcriptome technology that's at single cell resolution, we, we might have been able to capture these features as well. But due to the technology, we, we were not able to. Um, now, the single cell RNA-seq data set that I used um, had a... Uh, a, a experimental perturbation um, incorporated uh, in it. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll show that a little bit more in a, in just a moment. So from this from this integration of, of real data, what we see is that if we perform the the stab map um, uh, low dimensional embedding, just like in our simulation, you know we can see that we have good overlap between the two different uh, technologies, um, and we have pretty. Uh, we have quite good um, distinction of, of cell types in space. Now, not only do we see uh, the colors being separated out, but even within colors, we're seeing uh, different um, shapes emerging. So for example, this green here corresponds to the forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain subcluster. And so, you know, if, if we go back to the original um, 
UMAP, that was just sort of one group, whereas here it's elongated into, uh, you know, the, the, the compartments themselves corresponding to the physical space. And um, what I sort of illustrate a little bit more is that, you know, we have uh, experimental perturbation information based on a gene knockout for these uh, cells. Um, and so using um, the, 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 the transfer approach for SABMAP means that we you were able to take the, the information from the single cell RNA-seq perturbation and actually map this into our physical space. So, you know, this is our embryo one, that shape. Uh, remember the head and the, the, um, the trunk and so on. So what I've colored here is um, the mesoderm. So this is the, the area that uh, sort of covers uh, the, the inner organs that are going to be um, uh, developing um, across all our, our three replicates. And what we see is that there's an anterior to posterior uh, enrichment followed by depletion of these particular knockout cells. And that allowed us to then follow up and look at particular genes that, that are um, uh, relevant to this. And so this allowed us to basically perform a joint integration of, of dissociated single-cell RNA-seq data and spatial data in, in a way that helped us to use the spatial coordinates to help stabilize. And so with that, um, you know, I'd just like to revisit the goals of this project. So, you know, we, we developed a technique that performs mosaic data integration um, and that uses these non-intersecting features. Um, we're, we're able to perform this sort of disjoint uh, uh, approach so that we can pull information out from multiple different um, topologies. Um, and uh, we're able to incorporate prior information. So, you know, we can use uh, uh, principal components or we can use um, linear discriminants in this. Now, a challenge for this work um, is <coughs> excuse me, that handling multi-omics data input, so say two different types of modalities as one, um, is uh, at present is um, used via concatenation and it's assumed that the user performs some uh, sort of vertical uh, integration in some way uh, to handle that. Um, but StabMap could be used together with another sort of bespoke techniques that, such as um, multi-omics factor analysis. So, so long as you've got a way of performing the projection, um, so long as it's uh, deterministic, then StabMap could be extended towards that, um, towards that, that goal. Um, and to summarize, uh, so I've uh, showed you a, a new approach for mosaic data integration, um, which uses a data topology um, to use. Um, it stabilizes our joint mapping and uh, facilitates downstream analyses. Um, and uh, I'm going to use this last few minutes just as a, a plug to say that I am uh, recruiting uh, as well. So, you know, if these sort of project is something that you, you think uh, you're interested in, or if you know that someone's interested in, um, please, please uh, reach out. Um, and I'd love to have more of a chat. And finally, I'd like to thank um, everyone involved in, in, in this project and uh, every sort of discussion I've had um, since and for you for the invite as well as for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Sheila. It was a great presentation. Um, do we have any question from the audience? Start with Kevin. Hi, Sheila. Uh, thank Hi. you for the great talk. Um, if I um, go back to one of the slides, if you could go back to one of the slides where you have those overlapping blocks of red and blue and yellow. Um, like if I understood that slide correctly, uh, you would have some overlapping features between the uh, each of the blocks for the technique to work. 
Uh, is that yes. right? Yes. Yes. Yep. So okay. you sure. must have at least some overlapping uh, between any of the, the blocks, right? Um, so, so my question is, um, how much overlap would you need? Mm. Uh, are we talking about 10% of the genes or, you know, just out of interest, you don't... You know, a, well, a, I think that's a great question because it is it is that sort of, you know, how long is a piece of string? Like, how good do you want your embedding to be um, kind of question? Um, now, it, it very much depends on the quality of those features. Um, so, you know, you could have 10,000 features that are not actually informative. Um, and what does it matter? Or you could have 10 features that are actually relevant to the underlying biology and there you go um <clears throat> so based on the the simulation um uh it does seem that uh if you have um for for the for the multi-omics example um as far as how many features you need it's it's not super duper clear i'd say that you know you you are sort of selecting among like you are performing some feature selection to begin with so you know you're, you're sort of taking like the most highly variable or like the most predictive based on some other criteria um the other point uh to also consider kevin is the number of cells, the number of observations that you need to be able to uh, perform this. And overall, it seems for us, um, you need around about a thousand or so cells, um, which is sort of within within the range of, of the technologies at present. You know, a single experiment would generate maybe about 10,000 cells. Um, so yeah, it seems like it's it's pretty uh within the realm of applicability <laughs> sure thank you all right um Mohammed? hi sheila uh thank you very much for that nice presentation just i have a question in this uh, slide uh, like you eliminate uh, features that are not in common between those uh, likes or you consider in your model model. Um sorry, I didn't understand. Could you say could you reformulate that, Mohammed? Uh the features that are, are not common in those blocks, you know, for instance, the red, blue, and ye uh, yellow. Mm. So there are some features that are not in like there is not overlap between the, the blocks, right? Yeah. Uh my question here is that uh, do you remove or like eliminate those features? Do I eliminate them? Yep. Um, I mean, the, the, so I do perform uh, an initial feature selection step depending on the intersection. So say if you have, uh, you know, many, many thousands of features, like in our single cell RNA seq example, you know, you would have twenty thousand features um, to begin with, um, and then only a few hundred uh, in in the the, the seq fish data set. And so, to perform that initial uh, reference um, uh, reference space, I wouldn't be using the full twenty thousand. I'd be using some uh some sort of subset of that to perform to to generate the reference space uh and then you know say if among the intersecting features again say that's you know quite huge um it is it is a parameter i set it at a thousand um uh features it could be changed in the software if you like um for for the number of features that uh, are used in the uh linear model so yeah, like yeah, if if it was huge, 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 then there are some um, steps there to to make it more tractable. So in this case, you like the important features are selected among those overlapped ones. Is that right? Yeah, for the projection. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you very much. No. Thank you. Nishi. Hi, Sheila. Thank you for hey. the great talk. Nice. So uh, I have questions that is still related to this slide. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so imagine if there is a link between uh, red and uh, yellow as well. Mm. So what do I do? I mean, yeah, what do you do? Like, how yeah. do you determine which direction to go first? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and so the so the question is, what if you had overlap between um all of them? So say if this network was completely connected. <coughs> so so this uh mosaic data topology the network is is weighted and it's weighted by the number of features by default um and so then the shortest paths are calculated across a weighted network so it's like the weighted shortest path if you will um so yeah like that that could be uh, a good thing it could be a bad thing um you know you could have like i said more features that are not really informative um by default uh it, it makes that assumption that more features is maybe more informative thank you nice thanks sheila um, I have a, just a brief question regarding the computational component, right? So mm -hmm. how large have you actually tested your method on and how, you know, how far do you think this can scale? Mm. <clears throat> it's a good question. <clears throat> so I've tested it on um, probably around the tens of thousands of cells and on the tens of thousands of features. Um, now, in terms of the computational sort of demand, um, what you're essentially performing is, uh, you know, PCA followed by linear models, followed by PCA followed by linear models, and so on and so on. So it's, it's sort of clever applications of these. Um, uh so it would be sort of as as scalable as those are um yeah the the challenge i think would actually be in the data representation um in the implementation so at present uh if you if you applied a stab map what you need to do is input a list of data matrices so, so long as you're able to provide that list of data matrices, um, then you should be able to uh, extract uh, a stab map embedding. Um, and you can very much think of it as, as like a replacement to your uh, restrict to uh, overlapping sets and then PCA. So you can think of it as a replacement to the PCA stab. Um, and then you could perform a, a downstream horizontal uh, data integration, such as SC Merge or such as Mutual Neuros Neighbors and so on. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Um, do we have a quick question from online? Let me try. Since we don't have, <coughs> um, so we are um, a bit, we have, question oh yes we have a prize for tonight um uh, uh, an R yes so one two three four okay. oh yeah that's true sheila, sheila give us a random seed in R. oh oh what you want something from me uh, 10. Oh, 10. Yishin is the winner. <laughs> so for, this was the first time we had a, um, an award uh, um, for the people attending the, uh, our uh, event. So congratulations, Yishin. Yes, uh, Kelvin will be in touch. With the prize. <laughs> With the prize.
But apart from this, thank you very much, Sheila, to joining us today. Um, like even if uh, just online, thank you very much. <laughs> and thank so you so much for having me. Thank all of you to attending in person on online. Uh, we'll be um, in touch uh, with our next event, which should be at the end, more or less at the end of all this.